Hello, everybody. Uh, we'll just... We'll start in uh, 10 minutes, five minutes at uh, 3 p.m. sharp. So, yeah, let's wait till then. Uh, we have already, uh, like, I think uh, everybody uh, from the panel is here. So let's let's wait for uh, rest of the people to join. We'll start at sharp three. Thanks. Yeah, we are starting in three minutes. Uh, I think uh, uh, we have muted ourselves till then. Uh, we are waiting for rest of the people to join. We can see roughly 65 people have joined. So I think we had uh, around 200 registration. I think I'm expecting around 120 odd people to join. So let's wait for them. Uh, and it's two minutes, 45 seconds to go. We'll start at sharp. Uh, schedule time, so we'll not push that further. Uh, but let's wait till the schedule time.
Hello everyone. Uh, this is Harshit from Macnox. Uh, I've got uh, Shubho and Nishant as uh, co-host today. So, uh, topic for today's session is uh, uh, on on how to perform API security testing. So, uh, let me know if you if, like. I think my screen is visible to everybody. So, I'll I'll, I'll just uh, get started with our webinar today. So. Uh, the topic is how to perform API security testing. Uh, I'll not take too much of time. And uh, and uh, uh, let's let's uh, uh, introduce the speaker. So uh, I've got uh, Shubho Haldar, who is CTO and co-founder at Aptox, uh, and he's also founder of, of AFE, uh, Android Framework for Exploitation. And we've got uh, Nishan, who is a senior security researcher at Aptox. And uh, Nishant has also participated in a lot of bug bounty programs and all. So uh, uh, the topic for today is, as I mentioned, API security testing. So briefly the agenda. So basics of API security testing. So I'll take hardly two minutes to just uh, uh, like position what exactly API security testing is very briefly uh, in theoretical way. Then we'll move to uh, live uh, webinar of like what all tools can be used and uh, uh, with that live demo of using those tools. So let's let's move ahead. So basic of API security testing. So uh, since we all know that APIs connect to our most uh, intimate and sensitive sensitive data, so it is very important step of security assessment to check if APIs are secure or not. Some of the basic rules uh, for API security testing are that if you are giving any input to API, you must uh, the API must provide whatever expected output uh, it should give. So you should check that while doing security testing. Then inputs, uh, whatever input uh, are allowed should be in specific range. Uh, and uh, any value outside that range should be rejected. Uh, input of any incorrect type must be rejected. And any input that is empty, when empty is not even required as an input, should be rejected. Uh, and uh, any uh, incorrect size of input should also be rejected. So these are some of the basic the uh, API security testing rules that I'll get started with. Uh, so these are tools that we are going to use. Uh, so we'll be using SQL map today, Bob suit and Charles proxy, uh, DIR search, git tools, uh, show sure git and uh, git raw. Uh, Aquatone, uh, WP scan, AWS S3 API, Postman and Patitor. So uh, I'll, I'll pass this call to uh, Shubho and uh, Nishan to continue and uh, probably show us more about or probably explain briefly on what we are doing and uh, post that uh, they can uh, uh, they can like get started with the live demo and all as well yeah yeah uh, thank you Arshit, so much uh, for the brief introduction so uh, uh, you might have questions while we are doing this webinar. I would request you guys to select the Q&A option below uh, in, the, uh, in your Zoom panel. If you are watching it from YouTube, Facebook, or any other social media site, you can obviously post your question in the comment. And uh, we'll try to answer those questions uh, while going through the webinar. Or, uh, or at the end also we'll try to answer, but uh, no doubt all those who have signed up for the webinar will get at the end of the webinar, a list of all the questions which were asked along with all the answers uh, so, so that you will not miss it. So, uh, so to start off uh, this webinar, uh, what we are gonna do is we're gonna divide this uh, not in basis of tools for API scan security, but instead, what I'm going to do is we are going, going to divide it in basis of, uh, you know, few sections. The first part of the webinar, we're going to talk about API level issues. And, uh, 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 and the second part of it uh, would be basically the business logic issues. Uh, the third part would be the deployment issues. So in the API level issues, I'm going to talk about how we can... Uh, you know, use SQL injection, which is pretty much easy, but how we can do something more, like some more complex SQL injection things. Uh, then, 
uh, uh, and then in the uh, other issues like uh, SSTI, where we are going to inject few things in the template, uh, then we are going to also show about excesses. But what about blind excesses and things like that? We are going to uh, showcase something in terms of IDOR and how we can use tools to use uh, or figure out IDORs using the comparer or the intruder feature or how to do brute forcing to figure out IDOR. Uh, we're going to use Charles proxy to showcase if uh, you know if uh, if the application connects back uh, using protobuf uh, protocols or some binary protocols, how you can decode those protocols and how you can intercept those protocols and uh, and you know uh, uh, do an interception on top of that. Uh, followed by Postman, so we're going to talk about how how we can import uh, you know. Uh, Request and responses from Burp and uh, or Charles to, you know, Postman and create a collection of all the APIs which you have tested. So, so these would be the API level issues which I'll be talking on the first uh, first part. The second part which I'm going to talk about is the business logical issues, which will be like something like price manipulation, uh, uh, how we can manipulate price. Not not a very simple manipulation, but you know something complex. Uh, race condition between different logics. So this would be the business logical issues which we'll be talking about. And the last would be the deployment kind of issues. Like you may be deploying your APIs in your server and you might be using you know, Git uh, to do an automated deployment and things like that. In that case, how we can use uh, you know, uh, different tools to figure out whether your deployment itself is proper or not whether you uh, you know whether uh, we can figure out secret keys in your deployment or whether your code base has some security issues and things like that so that will uh, or or let's say you are using aws services whether your s3 buckets are uh, problematic or not and and things like that so that's would be that would be the deployment kind of issues uh, so uh, yeah, so so that is the thing. Uh, so now what I'll uh, do is we'll uh, directly jump off uh, to how uh, how we can um, you know uh, do do all of this testing. So I have with me Nishant, uh, who is going to showcase uh, the first part, which is the API level issues. And in the API level issues, uh, so Nishant is going to take it ahead from here. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Nishant from AppNox. I work as security researcher with AppNox. And so yeah, as Shubhu discussed the agenda for the webinar, let's quickly start with the webinar on discussing multiple security issues. So the first issue which, so the first issue which we are going to discuss is uh, SQL injection. So yeah, SQL injection, we'll be talking about how to detect SQL injection using burp and how to automate this and so on. So basically SQL injection are categorized into multiple types. One is error-based, one is blind and, and so on. So here we'll talk about error-based SQL injections. And SQL injections are basically caused by an application not having input validation and the server side and it accepts any SQL query as a proper input, right? So let me switch on my burp. So my burp is running. You are enter character one or C2. So yeah, here we can see there's a post request which has been sent to the server on this endpoint, XVWA, SQLI and the parameters, two of them are being sent, item and search. So to test for SQL injection and that to error-based SQL injections, the first step in exploiting SQL injection is give a special character which the SQL uh, DB recognizes and see if you're getting an error or if the application is throwing a 200 or it's becoming unresponsive and so on. Basically, let, let, let's just inject a code in end of the search parameter here and try to send it to the server. So 
here we can see there is a sql error message it says there is a error in the sql syntax on mysql server version and, and so on so this is uh, basically a litmus test to understand if there is a sql injection if it is potentially can be exploited and so on and here after this after this we have determined that there is an sql injection we can give more queries like one or one equal to one one and see what how the server is responding or you can give something like this and we have a error message and so on so yeah and instead of or you can also give uh, and or union with, with the syntax and see how the server is responding and the what is the error message you are getting so this is a time consuming process and if you are working on an engagement which is which needs to be delivered on some particular day you cannot expect the whole sql injection to be done manually by yourself that's why we have a, a tool called sql map which automatically detects and exploits sql injection which has multiple other functionalities also like you can run a command you can upload a shell you can dump the database you can create a user and, and multiple other things so we are just going to showcase how you can use an sql uh, sql map to detect and exploit sql injection so if it is a get request so this is a post request right so if it's a get request you just need to uh, right click copy as a url uh, which is yeah copy url and you get the get uh, url and the id will be in the url which the sql map will recognize and it will export but this is little different because this is a post request and there is a body with a couple of parameters and there are multiple headers so how do you run this into sql map so you just copy the whole data you just copy the whole data into a text file uh, save it in your desktop and run sql map minus r equals dot text minus v will be sql1 dot text right if i am not yeah basically this sql1 dot text is going to start scanning the whole uh, database from scratch and it will take time so we have already created a sql post dot text which has you can see which is the same which is the uh, local host xw sql injection with the parameters item 1 and such okay so uh, just for uh, people uh, some some of you asked oh, what is the application which we are using so we are using uh, an application called xwa it's an open source a uh, web application tool which you can also download it in, in your laptop in this case uh, we used the dockerized version which was pretty easy for us to host it and that has a lot of uh, you know um, exercises which you can do so we are taking the uh, error based sql injection for this uh, for this demo yeah yeah so basically he can, we can see here that uh, sql map minus r is the text file which we need to include and minus v is verbose so basically it created it it sent a couple of parameters so since it is in verbose mode we can see what is the payload exactly here so it sent a payload called item equal to 1 and it made a sql query right so i'm just highlighting that it made a sql query and it determined that the back uh, the database which is used in the back end is actually my sql so not only you can determine the database but you can also determine what are all the tables inside it or columns present you can also for example check what is the host name uh yeah you just run sql map with flag host name so it is going to fetch the server's host name which is this uh sorry this which is this and here since it is in verbose mode we again can see what is the exact query which sql map sent so that we can try to reproduce it ourselves using verb or uh, to tell the developers on how to exploit this or how to reproduce this vulnerability we can use this as well so that's the first issue uh, sql injections uh, 
So, uh, so Nishant, I actually have a question uh, from one of our viewers. And uh, so the question is basically, uh, most of these queries which you are running in the SQL map uh, would be blocked by WAF, right? Web application firewalls, which are there. So how can you bypass this WAF using SQL map or any other things? Like I still remember that uh, we did an assessment on top of where there was an AWS WAF which they were using. So oh, what did you exactly do to bypass those WAF? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so basically WAFs are just defense in depth and SQL injection or any type of API level security threat should be patched in the API level instead of putting a WAF or adding additional level of protection. So why, why I say this is because as you were mentioning one of the assessments which we were doing, we had reported SQL injection to one of our clients and what they uh, did is uh, they didn't actually patch the SQL injection by using parameterized queries, but they actually bought a AWS WAF. They were already using AWS EC2. So basically they bought WAF solutions as well and they configured the WAF to block our uh, SQL request. So when we rescan to check if it is a SQL injection is still possible or if they have fixed it or not. Initially, we were not actually getting any response from the server, but uh, so basically I'll, I'll just show you. So here, so say this is my request. Uh, this is the uh, request and this is, consider this is the server which has a WAF, which blocks certain query, uh, keywords like, and for example, consider it blocks and, or it blocks or or union or, or or whatever. So initially what we tried doing is again, we tried to reproduce by one and one equal to one one. We sent it to the server. It just threw a 200 and it didn't show any SQL error message. But when we did uh, something like this, which is not exactly a capitalized and which is a small, uh, smaller case A capital N and capital D, this will actually bypass the WAF because the WAF's configuration is to block and which is in caps or block and which is in small. So if it is capital A and D or small A and D, that will be automatically blocked with the WAF. But since this does not match the signature of the WAF, this will get bypassed. So we figured out that, okay, the, they, they are using a WAF and we need to go about bypassing this. Again, uh, doing this from scratch using just a uh, proxy to fetch the databases, to fetch the usernames, it's extremely tedious. So we were actually going through SQL maps uh, documentation and we found something really cool uh, in SQL map called Tampa scripts. So, yeah, so basically we found uh, Yeah, we found something called Tampa scripts. So basically what Tampa scripts do is they have uh, bypasses for WAF or they have a custom, say for example, I'll give you one more scenario. Say your uh, whole post body is being actually sent in base 64. So how would you test that? You, uh, you don't have to decode it every time, inject SQL payload, encode it, send it to the server, decode it. That, that's very tedious, right? So SQL map has a Tampa script, which will automatically use base 64. It will encode it and give you the results. So here in, in, in the scenario where uh, I was talking about earlier, we use this. Uh, we used a couple of Tampa scripts from the mentioned ones, which is between.py and Yeah, so I think uh, it could be like random case. Yeah, random case, exactly. So basically we can see example, right? So select will be changed into SC, small L, small E, capital C, T. So these are very helpful in assessments. If that too, if the application is using a WAF. Also here we can see there is a bypass for blue code, which is a WAF solution. There are multiple bypasses, multiple tools which you can integrate uh, like the one I said for base 64 and if it is blocking spaces and comments how do you go about bypassing that just we just need to see 
how uh, what are all the tamper scripts which are provided by sql bar and i'm sure one of those tamper scripts should be useful to mitigate uh, to come uh, overcome the waf or whatever is being blocking your request and not being fixed so uh, one thing which you can do also is basically uh, write your own tamper script so you can uh, so all of these scripts are uh, written uh, where you can basically go ahead and view what the script basically does and you can uh, use your own tamper scripts like use your own way of bypassing it but the first thing is figuring out if you are using some kind of waf is there a bypass to those kind of waf and and then figuring out whether you can uh, do a tamper uh, script on top of that now uh, uh, we have a lot of questions over here which is talking about uh, the first thing which uh, which i got is uh, this is a very basic uh, you know thing for a pen tester right uh in example of an advanced exploitation in case of waf scenarios but for that we need to uh host a waf to show a live demo uh, which is not possible uh, in a webinar uh, which covers a whole lot of other things not only sql injection but uh, what we will try to do is give you a, a direction where you can figure out how to go ahead with uh we have our own group uh we have a linkedin group itself where you can uh if you want to dig down uh, you know deep into some uh you know if you have questions regarding how have we ever experienced a waf where we had bypassed or, or or if you need some help with scripts we are happy to help you there in the group but uh for the sake of time uh we are going to just show this uh uh tamper scripts which is there and this is how you can do it you can write your own tamper scripts and and go ahead with it okay so uh, that's it for the sql injection so the next issue which we are going to cover is ssti uh, yeah ssti or server side template injection so basically uh, currently there are a lot of templating engines right so for example in jinja 2 there is a templating engine twig There is a templating engine, which in a form accepts uh, HTML character, uh, which in a form accepts HTML input. But uh, considering an application which is facing a client, which is uh, facing a consumer, you do not want to, uh, you do not want the customer to, you know, execute scripts on the basis of your server on on top of your server or something like that. so here we can see uh, the demo for ssti so the hint says that the template engine used this twig right and the loader function used this twig loader string whatever so the first step to figure out if the uh, if there is ssti is to check what what type of templating engine is the application using it can be jinja it can be twig it can be anything and the next step is to figure out what is the syntax so for twig we figured out that if you run uh, i'll just say uh, run admin right so it says okay whatever i have inputted that in in this box it says hello that string so what if i enter say 2 multiplied by 5 it says 10 so basically what what is happening here is i entered this payload which got executed and is getting displayed in my in my screen so basically this template whatever we gave is a multiplication for uh, in that twig engine and it actually executed in the server side and we are getting the responses hello 10 instead of whatever we input it right so what is the uh, threat here what is the impact of a uh, template injection here so a lot of template injection uh, templating engines like twig they also have a property where you can execute commands uh, using the inbuilt template engines api calls so here uh, so this is a payload uh, which we figured out so basically it uh, registers a callback with which executes and gets the uh, command name in this filter and this is id right so basically what this does in the back end is it executes id in the form of the web application like in the context of the web application so i just run this 
and here we can see that hello uid 33 so basically we just escalated that temp, uh, template injection to run command so basically here you can create a netcat shell you can upload a file you can download files and and so on so this is this next, uh, second thing so side template injection uh, the third uh, the third and last type of injection we are going to talk about is uh, blind xss or uh, blind xss so basically blind xss uh, we know xss is uh, so just to explain xss uh, firstly xss is something like when the input is not actually filtered from the user and from the client side that input can be either stored in a database or it can be just uh, previewed or it can be just showed to the user without getting stored in the database. So if that input, uh, say the application is written in HTML and JavaScript and the input actually accepts special characters, there is a way in which we can inject a script payload, right? So we can inject a payload which will automatically execute that script in the context of the web application. So if that data, so for example, if I inject a script in uh, Say, uh, consider this uh, enter your message here. I enter a message here and that message gets stored in the database. So basically whenever a query is sent to the database to fetch this message, which I saved, that script will be executed. So this is crossed and uh, this is cross edge scripting and uh, store and reflected are two types of uh, cross edge scripting. The one which we are going to... So uh, Ishad, I'm going to stop you over here. Uh... So for the SSDI, I have a few questions from the users which I wanted to answer. Mm -hmm. So can you go back to the SSDI demo which you were showing? Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the question uh, which I got was, how does five into two give you ten, and and what is, uh, you know, what is its significance, and what can you do with that? Okay, so as we were explaining, so the each of the templating engine has a different set of uh, syntaxes, right? So in in uh, Twig templating engine, so the basic syntax is you need to use uh, brackets, and whatever you need to execute, you need to whatever you need to pass a command or execute a command, you need to pass it in between the special brackets. So basically, uh, say in the templating engine, you are getting input from the user, and you want to multiply or you want to add those add those uh, characters or multiply these characters, you Basically, you do instead of doing uh, two into five, you're gonna what you're gonna do is you're gonna copy that in, into that special character uh, special brackets and you're gonna ex execute this. So this is the format for Twig's templating engine. So all the syntaxes will follow the this specific format. And here we can see this is getting executed in the server side. So what is the impact here is that as we were discussing earlier. Most of the templating engines have has a functionality or it has an inbuilt uh, API calls to execute commands, right? So using those, we can actually execute com com execute commands on the server where the web application is actually hosted. So for instance, so this ID is an ID command which is being sent to the server to be executed, right? So this ID, if you if I if I run ID on my system, so it's going to sh show who uh, who's the user who is actually logged in, what is the GID, UID, and so on, right? So here I'm going to send the same uh, command to the web application server and asking it to execute using the filter, which is uh, the syntax for that specific template, which is Twig, right? So I'm going to send this, and instead of hello whatever we have inputted, the the whole template uh, syntax which we sent to the server got executed. And here we can see that ID got executed in the server side and it is getting printed in the client side. So basically this is a command injection. Yeah, so... Uh, okay, yeah, got it. Got it, yeah. Uh, right, uh, so uh, while we were talking about uh, cross-site scripting, right, uh, so again, uh, so one of our uh, attendee was asking that why is it named as an API security webinar and not a 
web based traditional uh, webinar where we show where we are showcasing traditional vulnerabilities uh, so uh, i would like to answer that uh, along with nishant so for example uh, all of the vulnerabilities which we are showcasing in this webinar are basically vulnerability which exists both in web and api so again i'm not going to showcase how xss happens but there is a vulnerability called blind xss which you can basically pass it on an api and it might execute on the back end of a dashboard or, or some user and that would be the uh, example which we're going to showcase over here so these are all vulnerability this is the first part of the webinar and and most of this uh, vulnerabilities exist in api level issues where mobile apps uh, communicates with the server so so things like that is where we basically uh, come up with all of these vulnerabilities which we see it in our day to day activities in in our day to day uh, pen testing so uh, yeah so uh, nishant why don't you go ahead and and showcase how we do uh figure out that there is an excess uh, there is something called a blind excess because in an api obviously you do not have uh you know the ui to see right but you can obviously paste an excess payload probably it might execute somewhere but you have no idea i think that's what blind access yeah is. yeah shubho so that's exactly what blind excess is to give you more context i can ex uh, give you an example on where blind access might exist so consider there is a uh, mobile or a web application it is asking you for the feedback right so there is a separate column called feedback you click on the feedback and it uh, asks for the user email address and also the feedback which you need to enter so this data uh, will be sent to the uh, server and a customer representative will actually go through this feedback right so this even if this has an excess you don't have any deterministic way to actually say that okay i have in injected a xss payload but where will that execute it, it is not going to get executed in the client side which is in the browser side because it is getting saved in a different application altogether in a different database altogether how do i determine if there is an xss or not right so this is one of the scenarios where blind xss comes in place so blind xss take uh, can happen in any of the payloads any of the parameters the data can be saved in a different application it can be saved in a different database and it might be also executed there so to test blind xss uh, we actually use a free tool called xss hunter so basically what it does is it creates a domain name for yourself and uh, you can copy it, it generates a couple of payloads so whenever that script payload is being executed you'll get a email and you'll get a notification in the xss hunter app that okay your xss has been triggered in this specific location this parameter here are the cookies where the application has and, and so on so so like this so this is the uh, this is how the ui looks and under payload uh, we can see there are multiple payloads uh, which bypasses a couple of things html5 payloads and and so on right so i'm just going to use the basic xss payload so here i'm going to enter in this so basically what this payload does in the back end is it whenever this gets executed say there is a customer representative which opens the feedback page right whenever he opens this this script gets executed and a call back is sent to this specific domain nthapp.xss.ht so that once this call back is sent so we can determine that okay i got a hit from uh, the customer server so there is an excess because the script got executed somewhere in the application so i'm just going to submit this so now uh, the whatever uh, whatever script we have entered uh, script the source which have entered got executed now here we can we can see that there is no pop up no pop up or whatsoever so how, how do you determine that so go to i think you need to execute it once more uh Yeah. 
Yeah. So basically, the excesses payload which we entered in this box, this specific box executed, and here we can see the uh, excesses hunter is saying that okay, I have figured out uh, excesses for you, and I'm gonna just see the full report. So basically, what it does is it takes a screenshot of wherever the excesses got executed. It can be an admin panel or it, it can be anything. It takes a screenshot of that specific page where the excesses got executed. It is going to say, where is the origin? Here, the origin is in, origin is in localhost. This is the IP address. This is the referrer user agent. And one important thing here, uh, what we have is cookies. So consider the application which has a login functionality and it is facing uh, in internet and we have figured out the XSS, it will automatically send the cookies as a part of the header. So basically, we just need the cookies to log into that specific user's account. And yeah, this is how blind XSS works. So basically, we can see, we can create a report, we can see the screenshot, what is the victim IP and, and so on. So yeah, this is uh, XSS. Uh, so we discussed three different type of issues, right? So SQL injection, uh, SSTI, and XSS, all are uh, one or the other type of uh, injection attack. So how do you prevent this? So the first step of uh, prevention should be the input which has been getting from the user, like the input which has got from the user that should always be sanitized in the server side. So it should be checked for special characters, uh, database uh, commands or script tags and whatever is not necessary should actually stripped and sent back to the user and also whatever data is being printed on a page that should be encoded so that it doesn't get executed yeah so first we have uh, we have covered a couple of injection attacks the next one is uh, IDOR, which is prevalent in a lot of applications which we have tested, IDOR or insecure direct object reference. So the basics of this issue is, uh, so the basic of, of this issue is that uh, whenever the database, whenever the application queries the database to fetch some data, uh, for example, it can be profile data, the authorization is not happening based on the token, but on the resource identifier so I'll, I'll so yeah here we can see that there is a get request uh, we can see there's a get request which is querying for the item uh, with the number one there is a session uh, id as well so basically the problem here is that the database is querying the data based on this identifier, which can be modified by a user who's uh, in between the client and the server. So basically if I send this specific uh, query, which will, yeah, which will show us the data of the item code XVWA0987, right? So what if I change the item number from one to three? Yeah, here we can see there is a XVWA 4589, which is a completely different item. And we, so this is a, a very important uh, step in securing your APIs because all the uh, you might use these type of resource uh, resource identifiers in your applications as well so a lot of times what happens is that the database uh, uh, the query which is being sent from the client to the server and server to the database to fetch the data they are just checking this parameter what is the parameter which is passed from the client side is it three is it one is it two or if it is a profile data is it nishant or shubhu at uh, appnox.com what is the email address being I want you to get the data for? So that should never happen. And always, once you securely log in a user and authenticate him and give an access token, that access token, so here, which is PHP session ID uh, in, in our case, this access token should be mapped 
to the user ID uh, and also user ID or whatever identifier which we are uh, implementing. And this access token should be uh, authorized to fetch the resources. For example, this authorization token can only fetch the resources of item one. And if there is a second user who is actually buying item two, that user's authentication token should be used to fetch item two. So yeah, that's IDOR. Uh, that is the that is again one of the most common issues which we uh, figure out in our mobile application security testing. Yeah, so basically, uh, say you want to say this number is pretty uh, random, right? So item number is one, and the next item number is two hundred and thirty-six, and the next item number is uh, five hundred and fifty-two, or what, whatever. How do you uh, check this, like? You cannot query a single item by single by uh, item by item. It, that's not feasible, right? So how do you check this? There are two ways, uh, like one just using burp, which we prefer. So using burp, you just need to send this uh, request to intruder. So you get the attack tar uh, target port number and, and so on. So clear this. So what is the parameter which needs to be checked for IDOR here? Uh, this is item and what 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 needs to be changed the number three so we just add a payload here uh, payloads positions here and you go to payloads you choose there are multiple uh, different types of payloads you can generate usernames character blocks dates and so on so i create a number here i say on a brute force from one to twenty with a step of one Here the minimum integer I gave is one is because it starts from one and the maximum is 20. So the max can be 20 and there are no fractions. So it's one, two, zero, zero. I want to brute force from one to 20 and I click on start attack. Basically it will query from, uh, see there is item one, item equal to one, item equal to two, item equal to three. Till whatever number you give the intruder is gonna brute force and tell you, okay, these are all these, uh, data like you can see the response you can filter the response based on 200 300 400 or 500 you can comment and so on and also one more thing you can do is you can go to the options you can set the number of threads so if you set say 100 threads it's going to take uh, some of your resources but it, it's going to be pretty faster than uh, using a using five threads so that's uh, that's how you automate it so we also have a different tool, uh, which uh, not only is used for IDOR, but we use this for uh, brute forcing user credentials in a FTP or a HTTP or, or something like that. So uh, Nishan, we have a question uh, from someone who was asking me, uh, is there a way where you can brute force UIDs with, instead of a simple integers to explore, to explore IDOR or BOLA? Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, it is uh, to brute force a UUID, which is like 16 or 20 bits, it's it's not feasible, right? It, it is going to consume a lot of uh, resources. That is not feasible. But we have come across, come across such implementations where there is a UUID, which is like 30, 40 characters. But there was IDOR. How we were actually able to uh, exploit the IDOR was there is there was a forgot password page. Right, so forgot password page. I give the victim's ID. Say, uh, victim here is Shubo. Instead of my user ID, I give forgot password Shubo at appnox.com. What happened there was it was sending a uh, OTP mail to Shubo, but it was also printing the UUID of Shubo. So from there, I was actually able to uh, obtain the UUID of Shubo, which is pretty long. And uh, in, in my get profile API, what I did was I just changed my UUID to Shubo's UUID and I was able to see uh, Shubo's data. So basically the fix is not the UUID or uh, changing the integer to something very random and pretty long, but the fix here, which needs to be implemented by the developers is that uh, the token should be mapped to the user and that should be authorized only to fetch his resources. So you are saying that it should be a static, it should not be a static UID per user. It needs to be generated per, per 
per session. session. No, that that's not necessary. It can be a static UUID. It can be a number like one, two, three, four also. Like that doesn't matter. So as long as the logic as, is lo logic is secure, as long as the access token is used and not the user identifier is used to fetch the resources, it's it's uh, as simple as that. You can use number one, two, three, four, or you can use a fifty-digit character or whatever. Yeah, that's that's the logic behind it. Yeah, so uh, uh, back to it, we were talking about uh, we were talking about uh, brute forcing, right? Uh, brute forcing, right? So one of the other tools which we uh, frequently use here is uh, this thing called Pentator. Uh, yeah, so this is a brute forcing tool. Uh, which has multiple modules, right? You can brute force FTP, SSH, Telnet, SMTP, HTTP, LDAP, SMB. They have modules for multiple uh, resources, like multiple services. So how, how do you brute force that is you just give Python, uh, run, run it in Python, the file name, HTTP first is brute force HTTP based API. And I give the URL method is post here and body Say there is a body with username and password. I give file zero and file one. I declare uh, declare the file zero here with whatever is the username, whatever is the password, uh, dictionary, and so on. And here also, I, I can also uh, grep or reverse grep based on the error messages on based on the status codes so that only uh, successful results is what, what I'm looking for. So that's one more uh, way you can actually brute force, uh, intro, uh, brute force uh, credentials or test for IDOS if it is pretty long. Okay. So, uh, and one more the one more thing is that uh, developers tend to use Postman a lot, right? So it's very easy for them to test API APIs on. If there is a failure, what is the uh, what is the body parameter sent and so on. So basically, that uh, in Burp can be actually used along with Postman also. If you want to test using Postman, that is also possible. From Burp, there is an option as we saw earlier, right? So you copy as curl and you start Postman. You import it. Paste raw text. Just copy the curl, whatever you copied from your burp session. You just import it. Here we're going to see whatever burp was actually showing us. There is a get request to specific IP. There are two, uh, there is a parameter, there is a header, and so on. This can be used as well uh, for API level testing. So the next one, uh, which we are going to talk about, is gRPC. Uh, so actually, Shubo will be uh, sharing the screen for that. Uh, I'm actually switching the screen from mine, mine to Shubo's. Okay. So uh, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'll I'll just share my desktop. Uh, so uh, so uh, now in the in the API level category, there, there would be some uh, uh, binary, uh, which uh, which is going going to be there. Shubo, you are on mute. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Uh, I'm sorry for the uh, goof up, the tech goof up which happened. Uh, okay, so coming back to uh, the presentation once again. So what I'm going to talk more about is uh, uh, whenever uh, we talk about API or API level security, there are things like binary protocols, which also comes into the picture. For example, in this case, we are going to showcase a demo gRPC protocol and how you can uh, basically do an intercept of this kind of gRPC protocol, perform a man in the middle attack and perform, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, changing the parameter and things like that. So in this case, uh, again, this is all related to a mobile app. So we have an app running in a mobile device, which I'm not going to show because 
uh, I'm only going to talk about uh, the API level issues. So in this case, I have my Charles proxy already on. Uh, so you guys can download Charles proxy, which is kind of free. And in Charles proxy, you can, uh, for example, in this case, uh, my proxy has started in 8081. Uh, and I'm going to start my server and I'm going to, uh, you know, do a gRPC connection uh, to my server. So if I do a gRPC connection to my server, uh, basically, okay, I need to start the record. So when I click on start record, basically all the API requests which is getting will be recorded now. So again, I'm going to uh, redo it once again. Uh, okay, let me just clear this. And let's try to connect to the gRPC device once. Okay, I, I think I need to start my gRPC server, local dem This is just like a sample app and I'm, I'm running a server over here and I'll try to reach this server using gRPC. Uh, let me retry it once again with 8080 as a proxy and Let's do this. Okay, uh, it is not yet coming, uh, but uh, what, what I can uh, showcase is how we set this whole thing up. So basically, if, if you go to the proxy, uh, you can uh, basically uh, import, or so whenever there's a protobuf or gRPC kind of, uh, you know, uh, protocol which you are working with, you can obviously ask for the profile or the schema file. And when you get the profile or the schema file, you can uh, you can attach those profile or the schema file uh, in the protobuf settings. So you can go to the protobuf settings, and these are the descriptive uh, descriptive files which are there. So you can add more profiles over here. Uh, so basically, dot proto would be the file which you will be getting from the developers. You can convert this dot proto file into a descriptor file using the proto language. And once you load these, so these would be the definition of the protocol. And uh, when you do a man in the middle attack on top of the protocol, you can basically see uh, how the data is getting, uh, you know, sent. So let's try once again. And I guess this time it should work. Let me just go to proxy. Let's go to proxy settings. Let me just enable the transparent mode. And also let me see, uh, the SSL proxy should be disabled for this one. And let's see. Okay, at least some requests are coming. Uh, so for example, if this is the request which came and this looks like some gibberish request, right? Uh, so in this case, what you can do is you can view the response as protocol buffer and you can load what kind of descriptor. So just to give, give an example, like let's say this was a get balance request. Uh, so you can go to protobuf. Okay, let's, let's try this again. Sorry, we request as protocol, so not response. So once you click on this, for example, let's say get balance uh, response, let's say, uh, but since the message is not proper, so it, it gives an invalid tag. So you can select, I guess this would be the other response. Oh, okay, fine, but that, that is how you basically figure out, uh, you know, protocol buffer based uh, API. Uh, I'll, I'll just retry it once again, let's see, this comes over here. Okay. Uh, okay. Fine. But uh, I hope you guys understood how we can read a protobuf, uh, you know, protocol, and how we can edit those responses using Charles proxy. So what I'm going to do is I'll uh, hand it over back to Nishan to talk about more on uh, you know uh, business level logics which are there. Okay, uh, so the next issue which the, the as far as now we uh, talked about multiple level of 
API uh, issues. Uh, the next thing which we are going to talk is business logic issues. B business logic issues are uh, important to be tested uh, in an application because uh, each of the application performs a different uh, set of functionalities. Uh, for example, take Ola, for example, you can book a cab, you can cancel a cab and so on. And if you take, for example, a banking application, uh, it will have different uh, types of business functionalities. Like you can request for a check, you can pay, you can redeem an offer and so on. So how, how, how do we go about uh, testing business logic availabilities? Uh, the first step is uh, we need to understand what exactly the mobile or web application does and what are all the critical components in a critical uh, business logic components in that application. So consider uh, the application where uh, there is a payment option and say it's a shopping cart and how, how do you go about testing business logical issues in that? Right, so So uh, what are you trying to show? I'm just seeing the IP for the uh, server, which is OK. Yeah, so uh, this is an application which we had hosted internally for the webinar. So uh, say there is a consider this is a uh, application. Uh, this is a some application like a Flipkart or uh, where you can add uh, items to be to your shopping cart and you need to pay using a payment gateway and you get the order right. So here uh, the data the price data for each of the product is actually stored in the server side here we we can see only quantity you just can ent enter the quantity of how many items of that product you want and the server is actually uh, storing the price value right so here you can enter one or you can enter two so say i need to buy three items right i submit a query and it's saying 180 is the price which you need to pay right so and I enter one, it is 60. So basically, like what is the business logical issue uh, you can find here? Like what, what, what can you exploit here, right? So basically, yeah, so what, what can you do here is that instead of I uh, enter a quantity, you say two, and I submit a query, it goes to the server. I can change that two to say 0 0.5 and it send, send it to the server. And it says that it is 30. So instead of calculating uh, prices for three different items, it just calculated for, for 0 0.5 and you're going to end up paying less than for the three items. So this is one of the business logical issues which we uh, face in a lot of banking applications or e-commerce applications. So business logical issues uh, depend on, uh, depend on uh, whatever functionality being implemented. And you need to fuzz with different types of input, like it can be a negative integer float and so on to figure out vulnerabilities in that. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, we have covered a couple of business logical issues and API level security issues. The last uh, few minutes, we're going to talk about deployment level security issues, right? So say you have uh, developed your API, developed your, you have developed your application. How do you make sure that when you deploy that uh, application to your server, how, how do you make sure it's secure? So the first thing is whenever, so one of the 
main mistakes developer what they do is uh, when when they host a web application they just ssh into the server and they just do a git pull from the repo where they have hosted or where they have written the code and the whole application code will get will get uh, downloaded to that folder where uh, where, where the server is actually hosted but along with that dot git folders also will be exposed so why uh, why is dot git folder sensitive because dot git folder using dot git folder you can actually print back the source code even if you don't have anything else using dot git you can uh, use a couple of tools and get back extract the source code and if there are any secrets stored in that you can actually see the secrets and if there are any test files uh, which are stored in the server you can actually see like how 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 do you test this so yeah it's already 4 pm uh, but uh, i think uh, it will take 10 more minutes to wrap up so nishant uh, just yeah yeah sure yeah we will we'll go overboard by 10 minutes but we'll try to close by 4 15 max sure sure yeah. so there is this tool called dir search which actually what it does is it takes the ip as the input and it uh, it actually brute forces that ip with a specific uh, dictionary right so it has a dictionary of commonly used directories commonly used files dot git folders and so on so i just run this tool it is going to brute force at at the end of 8085 it's going to brute force whatever it it counters so so yeah, here we can see, okay, there is a slash admin folder, which was actually exposed, which we couldn't see just, like if we just saw this page, it is just 404, right? But there are hidden files inside that directory. So it runs a brute force recur recursively on the subdomain or domain which you give, and it will figure out hidden files and show showcase, okay, these are the hidden files and so on. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, using the brute force, we figured out that there is a dot git folder, right? So so what do we do after that? So yeah, uh, we have figured out that, okay, there is git is actually exposed. So how do, how do we go about this? So yeah, so git dumper is a tool, uh, it's an open source tool which actually takes uh, the input as uh, the exposed git directory and we need to give a directory name here. Uh, for all the data to be stored. So basically it creates a I'll just stop this. Uh, I'll just stop. Yeah, so basically this has downloaded a couple of objects from the server. Okay. Uh, and it has created a folder called admin uh, where all the Git objects are gonna be present. Uh, uh, we just go to CD admin. You can see the Git folder, which was. Okay. Yeah, we can see the Git folder which was actually uh, present in the server which, which was exposing it, right? So, so what is this? Extractor? Extract. So basically, dumper, what it does is it dumps the Git files from the uh, exposed server. It, it just dumps the uh, exposed files. So it has dumped config, index, logs, head, and, and so on, right? Okay. But extractor is the tool which is going to show you, like it, which is going to reverse engineer the code which was actually in the Git. Okay, so uh, you're telling me that uh, for the uh, for the dumper, we basically, if, if we go to the dumper once again, so if I run the dumper once again, so this will basically create a folder which, which will create a folder and it will download all the git related files from the server which is exposed and extractor is the tool which is going to reverse engineer the code okay. and give back got it
and uh, the the next tool which we are going to talk about is uh, the next issue which we are going to talk about is aquatone uh, basically aquatone is uh, a tool which actually can figure out subdomain takeovers like what is a subdomain takeover so uh, there is a say there is a subdomain uh, domain which has a c name which has a common name pointing to a different service right so i can use zendesk or i can use s3 bucket to uh, host data so that has a c name and after the applications uh, after it is done i i do not remove my c name and it is can be claimed by anyone so basically what happens is here what happens here is that an attacker can claim that domain which is actually free and can host content on your website so say there is a domain called appnox.com which is pointing to zendesk uh, dot appnox or zendesk.com and appnox has not registered or has expired uh, the uh, zendesk portal what it means that an attacker can actually claim that portal and he can host data on that so aquatone again is a tool which uh, discovers all the appnox.io star.appnox.io domains and it's, it is going to check if it is vulnerable to domain takeovers so here we can see there is a potential domain take takeover and which uh, which was which is hosted on the service called support.appnox.io and the service is uh, zendesk and the c name is appnox.zendesk.io which is actually not claimed that means there is no appnox.zendesk.io so when i create that i can host contents on support.appnox.io so that is the uh, last issue right yeah so i have another question uh, after all of this right uh, what i wanted to know is uh, how would a developer figure out that they are actually you know pasting keys and uh, so this is something which i talked in the beginning of the webinar oh. like you will be also showing uh, where developers are pasting keys in their git and how how would you figure out that there were sensitive information and things like yeah, that yeah yeah thanks for bringing it, it up subo so basically uh, most of the uh, companies will have a devops pipeline or they, they will have a sdlc process right so okay. this is what happens you develop this you deploy this test this in, test this in uat uh, whatever there, there is a standard procedure like right? yeah. so after the development what developers can do is uh, they can actually there are a couple of tools uh, which can be used to query the git uh, git organization or the svn repository to figure out if there is a secret key exposed it can be a secret key it can be a password it can be api key it can be a slack web uh, slack webhook uh, url or whatsoever so that tool is going to flag saying that okay uh, whatever code you have committed to this repository it has three four secrets exposed and you need to fix it so after the and after uh, completing the develop, development and testing and all that uh, there should be an additional check on uh, so i'll i'll go ahead so gitrop is a tool which actually checks for uh, yeah gitrob is actually a tool which takes uh, it which takes a repository name which which takes a organization name as uh, as an input and it starts a web server and it retrieves repository from each individual who is present in that organization so for example here these are our developers in our company so it will what is what it's going to do is it, it is going to look into each and every commit which the user has done uh, like all the commits and all the repositories and so on and it's going to say okay i have figured out uh, wait, just stop okay. and it's going to say okay i have figured out uh, there is a settings.py file and it has a it can contain a database credential or secret basically it has a lot of signature it matches the signature for a password or a key or whatever and it will say okay i have found this file exactly or i have found the password and so on so it, this also has a very good uh, interface uh, web interface you can just click on this you can see the file on github view what is the exact commit which needs to be removed uh, where is the password exactly being exposed and so on you can so th this actually does not have anything uh, so yeah using these tools you can actually improve not leaking your uh, secrets or credentials in git or anywhere
Okay, got it. Thank you so much, Nishant, for uh, joining this webinar and uh, helping us out in showcasing what are the basic API security issues which you have been working on. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, good figuring out all the things which you guys have been doing. Uh, Harshit, do you want to take it ahead? Yeah, so uh, I'll just end uh, in a minute. So first of all, uh, thanks a lot everybody for joining. I would request you all to uh, like help us with poll. I've just, uh, we have uh, initiated one poll. And uh, I think uh, 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 from the poll, we can see that, okay, uh, people were expecting for a more uh, like, like more scenario based approach and uh, probably more uh, complex scenarios and all. So what we'll do is we'll do another follow-up webinar where we can talk about it and uh, uh, discuss more on those topics. Uh, and uh, uh, apart from it, we'll also send a mail. So would request all of you to uh, like give us detailed feedback that will help us improve, make the next webinar more relevant for you. And uh, uh, for for like upcoming webinars, uh, we are doing in January. So we'll be talking about mobile application obfuscation. Uh, and uh, we will have someone from obfuscation industry probably uh, talking more about it. So uh, we'll get back to you with more details once we have everything up and ready. But uh, till then, thanks a lot for joining and I hope uh, this was helpful. And uh, we'll take feedbacks positively and we'll try to give you uh, more relevant content that, that you are expecting. So uh, again, uh, thanks a lot for joining and uh, thanks a lot for who was like uh, giving us uh, the feedback and all, and uh, I'll uh, wait to hear back more feedbacks over email as well. Thank you. Yeah, so we are, we are uh, closing the uh, webinar. Thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah, and we'll be answering all the questions. And we'll um, send over email, plus yeah. the video link will send over email and tool details as well. So you can take reference from there and uh, probably read more about tools and also get more details on how to use the tools and all. And uh, uh, in the same email, we'll also send you uh, the uh, LinkedIn uh, group invite. So anybody is interested, we can have discussions over there. And if uh, people are looking for more uh, advanced scenarios, I think uh, we can take it up over LinkedIn channels as well. Uh, all of uh, Agnox security team is there to answer plus share their, their, their details and all. So thanks everybody. Thanks. Uh, have a great day. Thank you.